Let's continue. In chapter 46, XLIVL, in some editions, the increasingly chaotic plot begins to clear up. It opens with the priest's observation that, according to the law, since Don Quixote is crazy, if the officers arrest him, they'll still have to set him free. The lead officer's response reveals the bureaucratic and clinical attitude that characterizes the modern state and the insane asylum. The officer with the arrest warrant replied that it was not for him to judge Don Quixote's madness, but rather to do as his superior ordered. Nevertheless, the officers are eventually convinced that Don Quixote is not worth arresting, and simultaneously, they get involved in the matters of Mambrino's helmet and the saddle. In fact, the officers transform from representatives of the law into arbitrators or referees in search of some social accord. They thought it best to retreat and even became go-betweens attempting to bring peace to the barber and Sancho Panza. Cervantes emphasizes the details of this process. Finally, they, as arms of justice, mediated the case and were its arbitrators such that both sides were, if not entirely happy, at least somewhat satisfied because the saddles were exchanged, although not the straps and the halters. Consider well how all this confusion is brought to a close. In the final analysis, peace arrives thanks to the detailed repayment agreement made between the priest and the second barber. For the basin, he gave him eight reales, and the barber gave him a certificate of receipt. And at this point, the narrator gives us a liturgical formula that emphasizes that the quarrels have ceased forever and ever. Amen. Parallel to this, let's say legalistic piece, the amorous case of Don Luis and Doña Clara is also resolved. Here Cervantes uses Petrarchan and Platonic rhetoric to indicate a certain cosmic harmony established among all the inn's lovers. Clara's face reveals the joy of her soul, and at the same time, Toraida rejoices at the satisfied face of her Spaniard, on whom she always fixed her gaze and hung her very soul. The phrase refers to Garcilaso's first eclogue. Even the last remaining problem is resolved, the most mundane of all, the matter of paying the innkeeper, who, well aware of the gift and compensation the priest had made to the barber, requested the balance incurred by Don Quixote, along with the damages done to his wineskins and the loss of his wine, swearing that neither Rocinante nor Sancho's ass would leave the inn until he was first paid the very last farthing owed to him. The priest calms the innkeeper, Don Fernando pays him, and thus the discord of the encampment of Agramante is replaced by the very peace and tranquility of the age of Octavian. The comparison alludes to the Spanish Empire, often justified by its imposition of peace at the end of the Reconquista. According to the narrator, harmony now reigns thanks to the good intentions and abundant eloquence of the priest and the unparalleled generosity of Don Fernando. But don't forget that this was a matter of making monetary compensation to the second barber and the innkeeper. Notice another detail. Thanks to the innkeeper's complaint, Sancho's ass finally reappears in the novel's first edition. In fact, if we have been reading carefully, we notice that this has been a gradual process. In chapter 42, Sancho slept with his ass's gear and Maritornes used its halter to tie Don Quixote's wrist. The second barber then recognized his gear in chapter 44, which led to the long and violent debate over the saddle in chapter 45. Literary critics have made much of the philosophical subtleties of the bashelment and the collective delusion regarding the saddle. But it's also important to note how Sancho's ass returns in these same passages, first creeping in via the details of its gear and finally reappearing completely in the innkeeper's comment. You will call me crazy? That's great. Thank you. Come on, Eric, you might say. What's the point of Sancho's intermittent ass? 
I would argue that the earlier disappearance of Sancho's ass was a warning about the immorality of his dream of becoming a slaver. If the incomparable generosity of Don Fernando brings peace to the end and metaphorically to the Spanish Empire, at the same time, Sancho's lost gray reappears and the problematic Mikomikon fantasy resumes. However, a great change or metamorphosis has occurred with respect to this fantasy. This time, Sancho is not fooled so easily. The chivalric narrative that everyone wants to build around Princess Mikomikona conflicts with Sancho's empirical skepticism. And over the remainder of the novel, our squire wrestles with the shadows of his own doubts. Don Quixote gives orders to his squire, saddle Sancho Rocinante and rig thine ass and the queen's palfrey. But Sancho responds with idiomatic expressions that indicate his disillusionment. Oh, master, master, and how much more mischief there is in the village than one hears about, begging the pardon of all those honorably present. Don Quixote's first reaction expresses his global uncertainty. What mischief can there be in any town or in all the cities of the world which could tarnish my reputation, you boob? At the text's most prosaic level, what has happened is that Sancho has seen Dorotea kissing Don Fernando. This lady, who claims to be queen of the great kingdom of Mikomikon, is no more so than my mother. And for a moment, Dorotea is catatonic. At Sancho's insight, Dorotea turned red. 